Okay, so do you hear me? One, two, three, four. Is that correct? Okay. So um, that was inspirational. I'm going to be down to earth and be back to another real-time framework, uh, which this time is developed uh, inside Microsoft. And I wanted to explain a bit what we are doing on that and what you can do with it uh, as of today. So first, I work at Microsoft. I have a specific job at Microsoft. I do a lot of things on cloud and open source. This used to be really specific a few years ago. Now we've got more and more people that are not only Microsoft product focused, but working more and more on well, a host of other technologies. So if you like something in there, just come to me and let's talk because uh, that's really what I do every day and, and more than half of the year. Now, um, SignalArt started a bit differently. So basically, uh, it started in 2011 in the ASP.NET team, but that was not an official project. It was just a side project by one guy. And he found that uh, Socket.io was cool, that a lot of things were interesting. And he thought that botnet had some strength to build something server-side. So basically, he started to implement whatever he could. Turns out uh, he was organized, and he was brilliant. So he put everything on GitHub quickly. Uh, it's been there since July 2011. And another member of the team joined, then two others, then people from the outside. and and. And, and and now you'll see if you go so I'll try to see if I have that somewhere else I'll find that for you uh, if you go to github slash signal R you should find a big code base with a lot of things going on so it's living that's 44 minutes old knowing that they have a nine hour uh, jet lag with us it's a bit surprising still working at night on that one. And basically, you'll find uh, the code base in itself. You'll find a host of samples. Uh, it, some are very uh, just educational. Some are useful. And, uh, and the, the strangest part happened a month ago. And basically, that uh, self-hosted job became part of the official .NET framework, and which is unheard of for two reasons, because it started open source and then went into the .NET framework. Usually, we do things the other way. And, uh, and it's been done in one year, year and a half, and usually it takes uh, four to five years to mature something into existence. Um, it's very light in terms of dependencies, and we will see that because we're able to host the .NET part everywhere, not only on Windows. So basically, you have two dependencies. You have JSON.NET to do all the uh, exchange and serialization stuff with the outside world in the JavaScript sphere. We have all the serializer for other platforms. And client-side, it's mainly as a jQuery plugin. That's not an obligation, but it's what we deliver uh, in standard for that. For that for that framework. Now, where would you like to be when doing .NET in real time? Basically, there's one strength both in Java and .NET right now. We have the ability to be really efficient in terms of concurrency, multi-core, parallel programming. We have a lot of experience in that because we come from the enterprise world, basically. So if you are dealing with those tasks, uh, have a look at what .NET can offer specifically in, in that specific area. We, we've been doing that for, for more than 15 years, and we have a host of frameworks and integration with, with those. That being said, you can run whatever you want uh, and, and not be constrained by, by that part. So what do we offer there? Uh, the, the baseline is really standard. We have some protocols to get to connection established between the clients and, and the servers. Those uh, protocols can be, as you can see, uh, what you expect them to be. And on top of those, we build two distinct layers of abstraction. So the first one is persistent connection. I will just show you that really briefly because it's, uh, it's exactly what you already know. And um, we have a base class that abstracts everything. 
and that base class, maybe I should go full screen, and that base class uh, then gives you a few, so I'll just show you exactly what lives there. Um, and you can see we, uh, we have a, a few overrides so that you can get disconnections, reconnection, and, and a lot of little things. And basically, you're just talking uh, with strings to the outside world. All you get is a connection ID if you want to target a specific client. And basically, that's all. When you switch back to the client side, we have uh, a, a, well, a JS lib, and you'll be coding on yourself what needs to be done there, exactly like in other uh, frameworks. So that's the first layer of abstraction. We built another on top of that one, and that one is called hubs. So I just take uh, some kind of sample chat application. So I have two set of samples here. And this one is relying on something a bit different. So we now have something called a hub. A hub maintains a lot of things for you and establishes a lot of things directly. So basically, you're not relying on the connection directly. You're just expressing what you want to call into and the client side and how you'd like to be called on the server side. So you simply define methods on the server that will be callable from the client and you invent names because that does not exist in .NET and those names will be carried on to the client side and will resolve on the client hoping to find some function called send in that case so that we can call into that function when the server wants to talk to the client and that's all. Um, there's a lot of little things that you can do on, on top of it. You have um, you have uh, reconnection management, you have group management, so you're able to target a specific, maybe I should um, show that quickly here. When you want to target your clients, you have uh, the all except if you want to exclude someone, you have others if you want to exclude yourself, and you have a group here, and groups allow you to, to send to a specific subset of people. This is really touchy because it means you are maintaining a list of metadata for each client. So we did not implement a storage on the server for the list of groups because that would block scalability. So what we do on that is we leave it to you. We have a few examples stating how to do that if you're a single server and, and in that case you store on the server. If you are with a, a, a rack of servers to handle more load, we have ways to do that on the client side, if you prefer, but that's basically your decision to make uh, for the specific group part. We have another one which is interesting on that, which is if you want to carry more data on top of that connection, you can simply express that by adding more information. So you can refer to a non-existing property that will be turned into a value that will be carried along the line, be it from the server or from the client, meaning that if you want to carry over a username or whatever, you just have to write it down and it will be implemented both sides. So that's a bit of magic because, uh, well, we need code to handle all of those. So if I just go to that application and launch it, um, I'm not going to do a chat demo. I just need the code to be running so that I can here go to signal R slash hubs. And that's the difference between persistent connection and, oh, come on. I should be doing that in another browser. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> so uh, I was going to signal r slash hubs and there you see that's the dynamically generated part so basically when we saw your your chat class deriving from hub we generated that little uh, bit of JavaScript and then you'll see here that we create a new hub proxy which has a name so you are able to plug directly into those from your JavaScript code, and it's pretty light. If I go to that chat sample, 
this is all the server side. Um, if I go client side, uh, let me show you a bit how it's done. So you've got up there the dependencies, uh, jQuery, uh, the signaler plugin, and signaler hubs that will generate the boilerplate code for that given hub. And then you're just referring to that. So basically, everything is on that screen. I'm uh, basically uh, plumbing uh, some message uh, div or whatever. It's, uh, it's a list to open the messages. And I have a button which is called uh, send. And I take the information from the message uh, input box. And that's all. The server.send is the name of the method that was defining on the server, except we Camille case because that's JavaScript. And uh, the, it, it goes both ways, that way. So that's all you have to know if you want to use that specific thing. And you have more information, but uh, everything is, is in GitHub. And we have quite a lot of documentation. Uh, so I won't go into details for that one. Now, some specific topics, because when you want to do that kind of things, it always blows up in your mind when you begin to do it for in real life. So how do we do the protocol negotiation? Um, basically, we have a general approach and some exceptions. So the general approach is, if we could do WebSockets, we'd do that. If it fails, we have a series of fallbacks. Those fallbacks are specific to some uh, browsers. For example, even source, we won't be tried on IE because it doesn't work in 99 or 8. Uh, the forever frame will be specific to IE and so on. I don't, won't go into detail. Uh, we also have the cross-origin stuff uh, baked in if you allow it server-side when you define it. So it will be auto-discovered client-side. And if the server allows for that, it, it will just work. And then we have exceptions, basically. So we know that in some situations, we shouldn't try, for example, WebSockets, because there's an instability there. So instead of starting the negotiation by WebSockets, it happens that for some browsers, we start at another place, just to make sure that it will be accomplished quickly and, and without blowing everything. So that's for the negotiation phase. Um, we have other little things around those, mainly to uh, work around uh, connection and connectivity issues. So a lot of things can happen. What we do, so yesterday I just closed the lid, went to dinner, and went back. And I captured what happened when I opened my, my PC. And it's uh, basically, uh, you can see that we are discovering client side that things are going uh, badly and reestablishing and so on. So that's the worst case because we had no clue. When we can get a clue, because for example, you are closing a window, we are able to send a notification to the server saying we are gone now. So that allows you to be able to react usually timely when people just disconnect. And you'll have the usual case when you don't have a way to, to know in advance that the client is, is going to not be there anymore. So don't rely on that as, as something that always works. But in the majority of cases, you'll get fast information about what's happening client side and server side. Uh, so Hub, um, I, I don't have a lot of things to say, just one. So that's the, um, the serialization stuff. Basically, when you define a class in the .NET world, we simply auto map to a JSON uh, instance when it goes back on the wire. And you don't have more to understand on that one. It's, it's pretty obvious. You can do more, but that works. Uh, in terms of hosting, so that's, one, that's really interesting because uh, it's not always done like this. We got rid of a lot of dependencies. And one of the dependencies we got uh, rid of was Microsoft EES. We don't want to tie you to a specific web server to run that. So basically, there is a thing called OWIN. OWIN is kind of rack for .NET. It's a specification with code. And it gives you the, a way to communicate with whatsoever server. So once you get that, you can do a lot of things. You can, for example, uh, self-host yourself if you want to uh, 
be independent of anything. So this is one. If I just go there, and here I have a small standard binary that's going to do exactly the same. And I can ping that thing and, and have everything on Windows. And the other one, so there's one guy who, who did a small um, tic-tac-toe server. And I just need to find it. Um, and that tic-tac-toe server, well, I have it there. So that's not a. Uh, so this is the, uh, that's hosted in two places. That one is hosted on Windows Azure, so basically on our cloud. And if I have network connectivity, I should see that I'm hosted on IAS on that one. But it also uh, basically used another one, and that's that one. And he took Mono on Apache on Ubuntu and hosted exactly the same server part so that you can host the server part wherever you want. I had that running on a Raspberry Pi for the server part. Uh, it, would be, it wouldn't be able to sustain the load for the client part. Uh, so that's for the uh, client side of the word. If you go uh, uh, server side, if you go client side, so that's uh, the Owen part. So clients, we have a lot of things. If you go to the Signal uh, uh, repo, you'll find out that we have the uh, JavaScript client and Silverlight, Windows Phone, Windows RT, and client, which is generic.net. If you dig a bit further, you'll find Objective-C and Java bindings. So I won't do a lot of things with those. Uh, but basically, I have somewhere um, a small example of what you can do on the regular .NET, and that's a console application, basically. So that console application is creating a hub connection with the server, and now it's able to be in the same environment than the other, other guys. Uh, well, I won't demo it, it's just a chat. Uh, and it's in the samples anyway, so that's one. Another one that might be interesting to you is that's quite recent, actually. It was committed a few days ago. Uh, Xamarin, which is doing the C-sharp uh, environments for Android and iOS, has been working uh, on Signaler as well, so that you can, uh, if you develop using Xamarin uh, techniques, uh, have the real time on the phone as well, and on the tablet. So that's for the client side. And you can cover not only web, but anything around it. Now, a small question. So I said before that we took some precautions for group management because we wanted to scale. So basically, uh, we scale on a very traditional way. We have each box connected to a bunch of clients, and we connect each box together with a backplane. That backplane can use several techniques. The one that we're using the most today is Redis. So uh, because it has a, an efficient way to do that, and if I go to GitHub again and to MS Open Tech, so MS Open Tech is uh, the part of Microsoft that's uh, doing exclusively non Microsoft things. And uh, they, so you can see some of them. And somewhere you have here a Redis port for Windows and 62, 32 and 64 bits, uh, which is not production ready in my mind right now. Uh, but you can connect to whatever Redis you want. And if, you, you're, if you're using that, you just have to inform SignalR when you launch it that you're going to use a backplane. And that's one line of code here. And I just, here it is. So when I, when I just put that on my uh, registration initially for the SignalR runtime, it knows that there's a backplane, and it will do the rest by itself. Uh, basically, connect to the backplane, see who's there, and, and, and so on, and dispatch the, the information. So that's for the scalability part. You will have you have a testing harness and stress clients into the Git repo, so that you can test on your own machine how it works. Uh, security, we chose to not build ourselves the security inside 
of that framework. So if you're hosted on the IAS world, you benefit from the security connectivity that's underneath, so you can use pretty much everything. We have standard connectivity for both and, and everything else. If you host yourself, that's your responsibility to find a way to, to do that to do that part. Uh, if you go back to the client side, so we made a few things. So once you have basically the callback coming into your code, you're done. Uh, you'll find some documentation around one thing that is quite common, which is Knockout. Uh, I mention it because Knockout is another thing that comes from, from the Microsoft world, and usually people don't know that. Um, so Knockout.js is... Uh, uh, we don't use only that one, of course, but it comes from, from that sphere. And the other one is more interesting because we had a talk yesterday on that. It's about reactive functional programming. So in my mind, Knockout and others are more for UI, and reactive programming is more for uh, single page applications that do interesting things in the page. And in that case, what you have to do is basically map server side some observable thing, so some stream, to some observable stream that will surface on the client. So you automatically get your streams flowing from whatever you want to do, async, parallel, and, and whatsoever on the server, and they resurface directly on the client using groups, using what, what you want on, on those. So it's a mature project. It's uh, supported for 10 upcoming years in the current version because uh, we, di we decided it was part of .NET. Uh, meaning that bugs will be corrected, and uh, and it's really open. J just browse to, in the repo and see who has requests, uh, how they are de dealt with. You'll discover, for example, that we closed an issue a year ago because we had no solution. We opened that issue three months before because we now had a solution, and we told the guy, now we know how to do that, you can proceed now. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, and as you guys know, it's the break for lunch. Uh, be back here at 2.10 for a couple more talks and a little surprise.